If you've ever been in one of our southern states, you may have taken a sightseeing trip just as this family. A trip to see one of the plantation homes that were built before the Civil War. This beautiful mansion is one of many homesteads that were once the residences of southern planters. These homes were centers of plantation life. Inside the mansion, we can get some idea of the luxuries that a wealthy plantation family enjoyed. The home was often beautifully furnished. Planters imported fine household goods from England. These things represent part of the wealth that came from products grown on the plantation. Richard Hall. Welcome to Vintage Movie Night in our virtual auditorium. Thank you to Coma Park so much for hosting this event. I love watching old educational films and sharing them. I don't always love the way they tell American history, but the film clips I plan to show tonight are important artifacts of how U.S. history has been taught and how the educators of the mid-20th century viewed the role of Native and African Americans in our history. If you want to see previous Vintage Movie Night programs, visit our website, nerdsmakemedia.com. And you can also learn about independent documentaries my wife, Simone, and I produce. Over the next hour, I plan on showing you clips from classroom films. I am not showing Hollywood films that whitewash U.S. history, although that could easily fill a big program. Except for this one hideous example you're seeing on the screen now, 1915's Birth of a Nation, one of the worst Hollywood films ever made. The history it shows is demented and actually helped lead to a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. That's sort of the baseline of the worst of whitewashing American history. Instead of that, I plan on to show you more subtle forms of whitewashing history using clips from public domain films that millions of Americans would have seen in classrooms and other settings. I don't plan to talk too much. I trust that as you watch these clips I have chosen, you will see how history was revised to diminish or eliminate the role of blacks and Native Americans. So first up from 1943 is a film called Land of Liberty, which was produced by the motion picture industry. They put all the resources together to give this view of American history during World War II. It's a rare instance where the filmmakers blatantly cheer on the white man taking his new home. America, asleep through the ages, vast primeval America, land of freedom and of hope, a new home for the white man in his age-old migration westward. For 
150 years after landing at Jamestown and Plymouth, English colonists were building homes and organizing local governments. Stout-hearted pioneers moved out for the conquest of the continent and made it our inheritance. They fought side by side with British soldiers in wars against the French and Indians for the control of North America. of the sea brought wealth to merchants in spite of trade restrictions, which led to clashes at the ports. Denial of their cherished right to vote their own taxes strained the bonds with England to the breaking point. Royal governors were the instruments of this short-sighted policy. Oh, my lady, may I present Mr. James Madison and Mr. Thomas Jefferson? Both of these gentlemen are members of the Virginia Assembly. Gentlemen, I welcome you to my home. We welcome you to Virginia, my lady. And to the house of her people. Oh, you overwhelm me. I must confess I hadn't expected to find such charming manners among the colonials. We colonists have learned to call ourselves by another name. Americans. See, my lady, both of these gentlemen are firm believers in the doctrine of equal rights. A dangerous doctrine. If the people of Massachusetts have learned to their sorrow. And dangerous to tyrants, my lord. Tyrants, sir? Are you implying that his majesty... My implication is a friendly one, your excellency. A friendly warning. My dear? Is Colonel Mason here? Yeah, is he here right in the reception room, sir. Unfortunately, this is often the only way you see blacks in educational films like this, taking the coat. Next, from the Chamber of Commerce, I wanted to show an example of how the founding, the earliest founding of America is often shown. Again and again, you'll see that there's sort of an empty America waiting for Europeans to come in and do something with it. It wasn't so long ago in the history of man's voyage toward a better world that ships were carrying eager passengers toward the shores of a new nation that was just in the building. Our forefathers were constructing the foundation of this nation by interlocking inseparably the blocks of our political and economic freedoms. life our forefathers established on this foundation of freedoms drew people from the far corners of the earth and all those who set foot on these shores had the opportunity to build a better life for themselves even young Jonathan an unskilled lad from across the sea hoped to find a job where he could progress according to his ability and enterprise Did you know that the founders of America, when they came here from England seeking freedom and a better way of life, established first a communal or collectivist economic system? They did, both at Jamestown and at Plymouth Rock. Let's look in a moment on the Plymouth colony. So when the communal or collectivist system carried them toward starvation, the governmental and religious leaders together proposed the establishment of the basic law of private property and the fundamental principle of self-reliance. Every able-bodied man was to become responsible for his family. The community-owned or government-owned farmlands and pastures would be parceled out for private ownership. 
people would exchange goods and services among themselves according to their abilities and desires. The industrious and the lazy alike would have to work or would suffer a self-inflicted penalty, one of hunger and disgrace. From this time forth, the people possessed their own property. Thus at Plymouth was established this fundamental characteristic of American philosophy, just the opposite of the public ownership system of socialism and communism. Did it change things for the better at Plymouth Colony? It certainly did. The change in ownership and responsibility from government to the individual citizen marked the beginning of progress in the colony. It helped to establish the foundation of the American economic system. William Bradford, governor of the Plymouth Colony, wrote in his diary that when the system of private ownership was established and self-reliance became the rule, the housewife came out of her kitchen and the children gave up some of their playtime to work in the fields so the family could produce more and have more and live better. The fruit of their labor was theirs. No wonder they were willing to work. Hmm, there's a fish. That's funny. I wonder how the pilgrims learned how to plant a fish with their corn. And how did they get corn? Hmm, you won't learn from this film. So now I'd like to move on to a topic of special interest to me. We made a documentary about the Constitution recently called Confounding Father, A Contrarian View of the U.S. Constitution. And I use clips from educational films in that documentary to show how the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention had traditionally been taught. So here's some short clips of depictions of the Constitutional Convention, and I assure you that none of them mentions slavery. And then after we show the clips, um, I'll give you some information about how important really slavery was during the Constitutional Convention. At a place called Independence Hall, a convention had been in session for many months, attended by delegates representing the various colonies. Whatever they were doing, it seemed important. Some thought this convention was a waste of time, and others were unconcerned. Still, it was the subject of much discussion. From nearly every colony, delegates had come, from the commercial north and the agricultural south from the ship towns of the east and the farm towns of the west. They soon realized that their job was not to patch up what we had, but to create a new union, the United States of America, with a central government. There were no rules to go by. Nothing seemed to fit. They had to find something that just suited their own needs, and they had to overcome all the ill will brought about by years of living as separate nations. There was argument and bickering. The convention heard a plan for representation based on population. This would give the big states an advantage because of their larger population. The small states turned it down. Compromises often were over slavery, but that's not mentioned in this Cold War film. They do refer to slavery, but not by name later on when they're talking about the Civil War. So here's that example. The country continued to grow and flourish as a union. It wasn't always easy. Sometimes it looked as if the whole system would break down. It nearly did, 36 years after I had gone, over an issue that the Philadelphia Convention had left unsettled. But the idea of union was a powerful one. It stood the severest tests. The task will not be easy. Everyone has a chance to speak and to hear the other side. There will be order and an honest record of the proceedings. This was Democracy in Action in 1787. The small state plan met violent opposition. 
Just interjecting here, if you're old like me, you might recognize Alexander Hamilton in the foreground there. It's the actor Ed Asner, 1955 film. Days and weeks of bitter debate followed. Tempers flared, charges of selfish interest, lust for power flew back and forth. As nights and days went by, there seemed little hope of agreement. No man could foretell what the convention would do. With both factions stubbornly holding on, feeling mounted higher and higher, the convention seemed about to dissolve in confusion. Let's hurry on to 1787. I just returned from France. Ah, France. 1787. That was a year in which a national government based on the popular will was at last founded. And a constitution written. Sadly, even as late as 1976, this National Park Service film directed by Hollywood legend John Huston talks about the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and never mentions slavery. Of course, the Park Service would never do that now. However, this film is still shown, I believe, at their visitor center. I object. I object to Mr. Randolph's plan. I say the Confederation does not have the power to discuss and propose it. New York would never have concurred in sending deputies to the convention if, if she had supposed it were to discuss a national government. The small states say their liberties will be in danger. The large states say their money will be in danger. Now, when a broad table is to be made and the edges of the planks do not fit, the artist takes a little from both and makes a good joint. Here, both sides must part with some of their demands in order that they may join. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Now I'd like to show you a portion of a National Archives event titled Slavery and the Constitutional Convention, which featured our Confounding Father documentary. I was fortunate to moderate this back in October, so instead of hearing my opinion, I want you to hear from the scholars on this topic. This starts with a short clip from Confounding Father. What the framers could do and did do was to limit slave importation to 20 years and to use circumlocution so that the Constitution does not include the word slave or slavery. What they couldn't do, and they've been criticized for this, and I think unfairly, is to have eliminated slavery. Then there's no union. No union, well, you know, what does that do? That doesn't help. It was not inevitable. To be sure, the Constitution would not have abolished slavery. But I believe that the multiple protections for slavery were not foreordained. Madison was so obsessed with winning proportional representation in both branches in Congress that he was willing to sacrifice the future of nearly three quarters of a million people held as property, about 20% of the population of the United States. In the debate over how to choose the president, James Madison says the fittest thing, that is the most appropriate thing, would be for the people to elect the president. And then he says, but if that happens, our Negroes won't count. And of course, what he means by our Negroes won't count is the slaves aren't going to vote. Uh, Virginia is the largest state in the country by population, but 40% of the population are slaves. And so if you can't fold the slaves into the election of the president, Virginia won't get to elect its presidents. So you get the Electoral College, which is made up by giving electors based on the number of representatives in Congress you have, and the number of representatives in Congress is based on the three-fifths clause. And so when you get to, say, the crucial presidential election of 1800, Jefferson is elected president because of the electors created by the three-fifths clause. If there had been no slaves counted for purposes of representation, Jefferson would not have been elected president in 1800. Um, 
And it's clear, it's open. Madison says it. People say it all the time. So for people who don't really know the three-fifths clause, and I'm sure there's a lot of myths and misinformation about it out there, where did it originate? So under the Articles of Confederation, each state had one vote in Congress, and therefore population did not affect the representation in Congress. In the new constitution, representation will be based on population. And the great debate, which takes up a significant portion of the convention, is how you calculate that population. All of the Northerners say you calculate the population based on the free people in, in, in the society, whether they are voters or children or non-voters or immigrants, it doesn't matter because all free people are going to be represented in Congress. So you count up all the free people, you figure out how many people you need for one representative, and then you figure out how many representatives each state gets. The Southerners say, wait a minute, our slaves constitute an important part of our society and we should count them for purposes of representation. And by the way, in the article, during the revolution, taxes and military uh, support for the Revolutionary Army, how many soldiers you had to send to the army was based on population. And in those debates, the Southerners said, slaves are property, you can't count them. You can't count, you can't tax us for our slaves because they're not people, they're property. And then if they get to the Constitutional Convention, they say, oh, well, 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 we didn't mean that. We know that slaves are people, count them for representation. And by the way, we don't mind if you count them for taxation because they understand that there's probably never going to be a headcount tax and there never is. I always find it just dumbfounding to understand why the northern states would go along with this. I mean, couldn't they see that they were giving the South much more power than they really should have had in the beginning? Um, what, what was, and, and as Mary Builder point out, it, you know, it continued to affect our politics. And as Paul just said, all the way up to the Civil War, why did they go along with this? I think uh, that when we start talking about, as Paul pointed out, um, these these uh, political compromises that the, the North was willing to do, um, and they were, I, I will put it this way, um, some of this is being strong-armed, and the, the North was still building. I mean, intellectually, the North was, of course, in a, at a higher level than the Southern states, but economically, they were still finding their way. The South was an economic powerhouse. And, I, and I've said this many times and I'll say it again. You take free land, you take people, kidnap them under, under penalty of death, pass laws and through violence, say these people must work for you for free. And of course you can build a mighty internationally renowned economy. And that's what the South had more so than the North did. Um, I also want to raise something else that goes back to the three-fifths rule found in Article 1, um, Paragraph 2, and that is they, they then tied into the population the three-fifths of, of Africans, as they were counted for the purpose of deciding how many representatives would be in Congress, but also um, the indentured servant. The indentured servants were poor whites who were bound under contract to work for free, sometimes referred to as white slaves. Now, they had no true freedom, but they added to the count. And so when you started thinking about the indentured servants, who were many of whom were, were in the, the South, you then again build on the number of uh, in, as far as the, the South is concerned. I want to con con connect to something that's happening today in the three-fifths rule. We think about the, the Africans who are enslaved, human beings who are enslaved, their number is being used for political expediency. Of course, no politician is going to ask these enslaved people, how can we best represent your interests in Congress? So they're being used the same way the incarcerated are used today. So you have people who are incarcerated in prisons outside of major areas, many some inside of, of, of major towns and, and cities, but most of them are outside in rural places where those people in those rural jurisdictions enjoy um, the increased population 
because of the incarcerated, which then brings to them state, local, and federal funds based on their population count. So you have something very similar happening today, where you have people who are counted in order to determine the number of U.S. representatives in Congress, but at the same time, those people who are being counted have no voice in their own government. So here's a rare example of a film that does show the brutality of slavery. Now that communication had speeded up, communities buzzed with activity. Marketplaces became towns. Territories became states. But this brought the new problem of divided local interests. And opinions began to clash on the one great question, slavery. Ships from New England flying the coast of Africa had made rich profits, picking up Negro cargoes and selling them in the ports of the South. So now I want to show you a bit of a longer clip from a leading educational film producer in the 20th century. This is from 1950, and they do show some of the realities of slavery, but they certainly skip over others. If you've ever been in one of our southern states, you may have taken a sightseeing trip just as this family. A trip to see one of the plantation homes that were built before the Civil War. This beautiful mansion is one of many homesteads that were once the residences of southern planters. These homes were centers of plantation life. Inside the mansion, we can get some idea of the luxuries that a wealthy plantation family enjoyed. The home was often beautifully furnished. Planters imported fine household goods from England. These things represent part of the wealth that came from products grown on the plantation. Here is a map that explains how this plantation was organized. It was almost a little community by itself. Most of the sections of land were devoted to one crop, such as cotton. Other sections contained orchards, vegetable gardens, and pastures, the source of food for the people and the work animals. The buildings included the planter's home, a mill, workshops, and a row of small cabins for the slaves, who did almost all the work we can still find remnants of some of these things on old plantations. These small houses were for the slaves who worked on the plantation. In this carriage house, the plantation vehicles were kept and repaired. In the blacksmith shop, such things as tools, wheel rims, and plowshares were made. And all of this was done by hand, the hand labor of the slaves. But what made each plantation depend mostly on its own labor and its own products? The answer is poor transportation. There were few roads, and many of them were in poor condition. So there was little commercial traffic between plantations. Travel was so difficult that each plantation was practically isolated, and so had to be almost self-sufficient. The easiest means of travel was by riverboat, and so many plantations were located along the rivers. At the boat landing, manufactured goods from cities could be brought in. Crops grown on the plantation could be sent out. Most plantations raised and shipped only one crop. In most plantations near the Mississippi, the one crop was cotton. Cotton was such an important part of the plantation system that it came to be called King Cotton. The enormous amount of hand labor required to grow and pick the cotton was supplied by great numbers of slaves. This then was the economic background of the plantation. Cheap slave labor producing one main crop on vast tracts of land owned by the planter. But the plantation was more than an economic organization. It was a social organization as well. The planter and his slaves were part of an unusual class system. 
the sharp division of people into two main groups, the owners and the slaves, left a lasting influence on the society of the South. What was that society like? For the plantation owner and his family, it was an aristocratic kind of society. Gentle manners, courtesy, hospitality. So I'm stopping there just for a little pause. You heard that right. Gentle manners, hospitality, courtesy. Now, I assume that doesn't include whipping and torturing the slaves, having sexual favors with the slaves or raping them, or splitting up families by selling them. This is the kind of thing that's never mentioned in this sort of film, and the result is, you know, I've met older people from the South who's, who actually told me, well, when I was in school, I learned that the slaves were happy. And that's the kind of thing that this sort of film uh, encourages. Many of the ideas that we still associate with the people of the South came from the days when plantation life was in full flower. This then was the social organization of the plantation. The aristocratic class of the landowners who had wealth and privileges and the laboring class of the slaves who had little wealth and few privileges. The plantation system in the United States reached its greatest development before the Civil War. By 1860, plantations reached from Virginia to Texas. On some of these, tobacco was produced. On others, sugar was grown. On others, cotton was the main crop. Whatever the crop, the system of producing was similar. Cheap labor, one crop, and vast tracts of land. These are some of the things we can better understand when we visit one of the old plantation homes of the past. But did this plantation life influence the modern South? Can we find anything left of the plantation system? We might find part of the answer as we look around us in the South today. Here is a scene that tells us part of the story. This plantation home was abandoned during the Civil War. Great changes in the plantation system occurred during the war. The freeing of the slaves and the great financial burden of the war disrupted the economic pattern. Some planters went bankrupt and lost possession of their plantations. But the plantation system did not entirely disappear. Some elements of that system did not change. The land, cultivated for generations and still productive, remained. The source of labor, great numbers of Negroes, remained. The demand for cotton remained, and the growing of cotton continued. So the plantation system, in a smaller and modified way, continued and can be found in the South today. Much of the work is still done by hand. Much of the wealth still comes from one crop, cotton. Most of the workers are Negroes who live on the plantation. Today, the man who owns the plantation is called the landlord. The men who work the farm are tenants. And so the landlord, the laborers, and the land are still the important parts of the plantation system. Today, this owner has less land than the plantation owner of the past, and he lives in a house that is less pretentious than the great mansions of earlier times. The tenant farmers and their families live on the plantation. Each family has a small house, which they rent together with a section of land. A few tenants pay their rent in money, but most tenant farmers on the plantations work their portion of land in return for a share of the crop. And so the tenant farmers, both Negro and white, provide the necessary labor for raising the cotton.
This film about uh, cotton was made by another leader in educational film, Jam Handy. And I want you to note that I try to put the source of these films always up in the upper left-hand corner so you can search for them online that way. I thought that this music was so syrupy that it was sort of ridiculous, so I thought I'd try to show you the same scene but replace it with some more realistic music and then also add some images of what slavery was really like. So now I'd like to show you some examples of how Manifest Destiny was sanitized in educational film. It is the year 1870, and the great American plains offer a vast open region for a new tide of settlement. With few streams and little water, the plains are nonetheless rich in deep, fertile soil. And there is room here, room for a man to farm, Room to carve out a new life. Room to breathe. At least that's how the Carter family see it. Theirs is a pioneer heritage. For their forebears, it was on to Ohio, then Indiana, then Illinois, and now it is the western plains that beckon. Once it was the pack horse, later the flatboat. Now it is oxen and wagons that carry the pioneers west. The father fought at Tippecanoe. The son was with Meade at Gettysburg. The mother confronted forest trails. The daughter faces the lonely plains. And for the Carter children, there are frontiers yet unknown. The American faith travels westward in the prairie stern. There are pauses in the journey. Each night, pioneers and oxen must have rest and food and water. Thus, while mother and children prepare a supper of long familiar cornmeal mush, Father leads the weary oxen to the banks of a nearby stream. And now, finally, the long journey ends. After nearly three months, the carters are on soil, bounded by claim stakes driven last spring. Past are the hazards of the trail, unknown streams, the dreary monotony of day after day under the blazing sun. They have come through all in safety. The soil is theirs. Ahead of them lies the life of pioneers. They will build their future here on the prairies by hard work, by unwavering courage, and the mutual helpfulness necessary to carve a living out of the virgin prairie. For their present home, they will use the small dugout built last spring by Carter during the planting and cultivation of the first crop of corn. 
That corn is now ripened and almost ready for the harvest. It is corn heavy with mature ears. A good first crop brings the reassurance that success may attend their new venture, that they may depend on a rich, friendly soil to sustain life. You can watch that entire film, Pioneers of the Plains, online, and I assure you, you never see a Native American. This next film wins the prize for most annoying theme song. I, I think you'll agree. was fine that morning in April. The winter had been warm. Already the blossoms were out. And in the fields, plowing had begun. But the farmers were not at their plows that day. They had taken their muskets and formed a line on the green in the village of Lexington. Ye rebels, why don't ye lay down your arms and disperse? Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired on. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. had been swelling for a long time, and on the 19th of April, 1775, it burst into bloom at Lexington and conquered in Massachusetts. What were the freedoms these men were fighting for? Freedom to govern themselves. Freedom to elect the representatives who would levy their taxes. Personal liberty. An air of freedom that would soon nurture a driving urge to build and grow. In nearly 200 years since the colonies began, there had been settled only a narrow strip along the coast. The new United States was a long, thin country with an unplumbed continent at her back. But then that driving urge came welling up. In the heady air of freedom, it could not be contained. Unless there was a subversive and enlightened graphic designer at General Electric in 1952, I don't think they intended that to be blood, but doesn't it kind of look like blood? Beyond the old frontier, there was a world of topsoil waiting for the flood. Under the rolling bulge of the land lay deep layers of minerals. Forests of lumber. The people filled their lungs with the air of freedom and went to work. To do the job, they had the strength of their backs. The strength of their backs. The muscles of their animals. And the force of falling water. Water power to turn the grist mills, to run the saws and the looms. I come from Bama, 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 I sort of imagine that this is the f type of film that the former CNN commentator Rick Santorum watched when he was growing up. Here's what he said about Native Americans. We came here and created a blank slate. We, we birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but, if, but candidly, that, that, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. I'm going to California. These men went home long ago, when the war between the states ended. But the hardy survivors, both blue and gray, still meet together once a year to renew old acquaintance. It's 1917, and they're camped at Vicksburg, Mississippi. What memories they must have. 
they have fought their war. While these raw recruits at Camp Custer in Michigan are being trained to fight another war. The call goes out and youth responds enthusiastically. So African-American soldiers and veterans of the Civil War were often not permitted to participate in these reunions, but you can see here, where I slowed down the shot, that they are serving the former Confederates. And then this goes into World War I, and they're often omitted from that as well. Barracks life in an army camp. More and more troop trains head for points of embarkation. The last cup of coffee before we shove off. A sobering moment. But we won't come back till it's over, over there. Then it's over, all over, and the world is safe for democracy. So the National Archives has a huge collection of U.S. Army Signal Corps films from World War I. They're available at their YouTube channel. And this is a really unfortunate film that the Army made showing the training of, quote, colored troops. And this is the type of thing that they did at that time. New Jersey shares with New York pride in the Palisade Interstate Park across the Hudson from uptown Manhattan. Conservation Corps boys working here are quartered in comfortable barracks near Englewood, one of New York City's exclusive New Jersey suburbs. Their task is to control erosion along the mighty river which cut through the Hudson Valley and left the Palisades towering as one of the impressive scenic spectacles in the East. So the white CCC boys are doing important work. Unfortunately, they showed African-American CCC workers and they looked down upon them. Happy-go-lucky Negro boys comprise one of the groups of Conservation Corps workers in the Berlin area. And inevitably, when two or three of these are gathered together, wrote a preface to the next chapter in America's history. And a mission compound whose name might otherwise have become merely an obscure historical footnote became a synonym for endurance and heroism. This was the Alamo. Texas won its independence after a long and bloody struggle, during which a band of 187 Americans met death and won enduring fame at the Alamo. So I grew up thinking that the men fighting in the Alamo were heroes fighting for liberty. I watched this John Wayne movie at the time, and we used to play the Alamo. However, recently I read this book, Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth, and I learned that the people inside the Alamo, by and large, were fighting for slavery. And Santa Anna, the evil general, was fighting to eliminate slavery. So I highly recommend this book if you believe that the people inside the Alamo were heroes. 
uh, read Forget the Alamo. And it's nothing new. It's something historians have known for a long time. They're just sort of, they're telling the history of the history of the Alamo. And uh, it's a great read. The frontiers expanded and the flow of the nation's commerce grew. The midpoint of the 19th century was reached and passed in peace. But as the late 1850s approached, a storm of violent opinion was building, which would threaten the very unity of the nation. The most tragic of all wars, that of brother against brother, was forced upon the nation. Soldiers of both sides went into battle secure in the belief in their cause. The Confederate soldier had behind him the unified effort of a culture that was actually a way of life. He also had a superb military organization. Perhaps more than these, he had a hot, defiant pride, a formidable confidence that he would win. He fought with a magnificence that did him high credit. And in the end, it was not his spirit or skill, but his resources that failed him. The Union Army suffered at first from overconfidence and a lack of unity. But in the refining fire of combat, these were done away. And by mid-war, the Union soldier emerged as one of the most effective fighters in military history. America's advancement once again made secure through the courage and sacrifice of her fighting men, stretched into the West and into the future with limitless promise. The two great oceans were to be linked. The continent was to become one great nation in geographical as well as philosophical fact. The great reach westward was met by the west reaching eastward. All this did not, however, go unopposed. The Indian, who had resisted the settlement of the new continent from the beginning, had grown bold and powerful while the nation was absorbed in its struggles for the Union. For some reason, uh, Native Americans in films like this always conduct frontal assaults right into well-entrenched rifles. Gosh, they were foolish. To the soldier fell the task of bringing safety to the Great West. It was a harsh assignment. The Army's Western forces totaled only some 10,000 men scattered widely across the vast plains. This 10,000 faced an enemy which numbered 250,000. He did more than his duty, wrote one Army general of this soldier of the West. He did more than his duty, and in the doing, he wrote a page of history which will be read and thrilled to so long as men prize courage. As early as 1832, the idea of a railroad line spanning the nation was conceived. At that time, there were only 140 miles of track in the entire country. Building westward. 1849, the discovery of gold in California. This exciting news spread rapidly and soon started vast caravans of pioneers westward to wealth and adventure. These were truly the empire builders. Eighteen sixty two, Congress had approved the plan for a railroad line from Omaha to San Francisco. The construction of this line was marked with many hardships. 
The Indians quickly realized that the railroad was a pathway by which land-hungry settlers would soon be arriving. It would end their happy hunting grounds. They attacked the construction crews at various points along the line. Naturally, it became necessary for organized force to maintain constant vigilance, to stop these attacks and protect the crews so that the work might progress in an orderly fashion. At long last, these empire builders had made it possible to cross the country by rail. The continent was linked from coast to coast. The westward sweep of empire carried with it a wave of new states, more stars for the flag. By 1912, our nation consisted of 46 states. Then, Arizona and New Mexico added their two stars to give us our present 48 states. The parade of the states and stars was now complete. There still are to be found Indian dwellings with that sylvan beauty and romantic charm commonly associated with the life of the red man. Generally speaking, however, the Indian housing situation has room for improvement. I don't think I really need to tell you what could be wrong with this film. And through the years, there has been constant change for the better. This row of seven cabins was built a long time ago for seven old Indians. Formal houses and Indians are not basically compatible. Before house building can be undertaken, the Indian must be convinced of the superior advantages of the white man's home over the shelters he has found to his liking for so many generations. But the transformation of thought is underway. The new Indian is the Indian in overalls, learning masonry and carpentry and the use of the white man's implements. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to show you a clip from this strange 1966 John Birch Society film, Anarchy USA. They argue that civil rights activists were communists trying to create a Soviet republic in the South. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. By duping the American public into turning a deaf ear to the voices of warning because the topics were controversial or because the patriots themselves had been ridiculed as extremists, racists, fright peddlers, the conspirators were ready to move one step closer to their hidden goals by precipitating mob violence. Riots, demonstrations, street battles, Detachments of a revolutionary army. Such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. You've been studying history, studying civet, but right now you got to put your history and your civets in the streets. You got to make the Constitution real. You got to make democracy real. Since 1960, since February the first, 1960, more than 50,000. Your fellow students have been arrested and jailed, beaten, placed police schools and water hoses. Before we see real freedom, before we be able to walk down these streets with a sense of dignity and with a sense of pride and walk in freedom, 
No doubt there will be more jailings, more beating, more water hoses. We plan to use everything within our power and all of the nonviolent weapons at our disposal to dramatize this blatant injustice and to demand that the federal government not put a cent in this city unless it decides to face the realities of desegregation. Right time, when Martin Luther King said march, we go have our march and cheese. <laughs> and you know they've kicked us around a long time, haven't they? As Martin Luther King said, demonstrators staged a huge march on Washington, D.C. to dramatize their demands. They staged demonstrations across the country. And as Martin Luther King said, violence was unleashed. Then accordingly, the federal government intervened and a vicious legislative step on the road to tyranny was enacted in the form of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. I don't know what John Birch was trying to accomplish, but the film seems inspiring to me. Well, this John Birch Society film was considered pretty fringe back in its day, but I'm sure it did manage to encourage some people to hate civil rights activists. Now we are in a situation where there are very popular people putting out just as crazy ideas. This one is the Tucker Carlson documentary, Patriot Purge. This is the uh, trailer to it. Um, and it's arguing that the January 6th insurrection was some sort of a false flag and that the people who did it are being persecuted. And um, So it's kind of crazy that, that what should be fringe is not really fringe anymore. Well, I wanted to end with something positive. So I asked the scholars in the National Archives event how are we doing teaching this type of thing? So that's how I'll end the program. How, do we, how are we doing now at teaching what we're talking about today? When you have laws against teaching critical race theory, there are laws in certain um, states right now that would prohibit this conversation we're having because people have bought into this idea of whiteness and purity and that their ancestors could never have possibly have done these horrific things, you know, uh, pass laws and use violence. What we saw on January 6th, that was what used to happen in lynch mobs in this country on a regular basis. So to be able to stay in the mindset of the purity of the founders of this country and the purity of those founding documents, we have to lie to ourselves again and again that this behavior, the economy, the greed, the need to build a nation on the backs of African American men, women, and children and um, Native American land is something that this country will keep embracing with schizophrenia at the same time that it's waving the flag and talking about liberty and justice for all. And until this country, as other countries have, owns its past and realizes with Sankofa provisions that we have to know the past to gain some insight into the present and plan for a more just future. And we have to do that. And hopefully at some point, young people will drive this to truth. 
Um, I know older people sometimes want to, but I think um, they they do it only inch, inches at a time. So hopefully America will do better than it's doing now because we certainly can. We have to grow up and, and embrace what has happened and take the blinders off and realize that we can't go forward in this crippled manner, emotionally and historically crippled. Paul Finkelman, you're the president of Gratz College. How are we doing it at teaching this subject in your view? Well, I mean, my college has an online PhD in Holocaust and genocide studies. We teach about world genocide. We teach about the Holocaust. I teach a course on world slavery as a component of both genocide and the Holocaust since uh, since there were millions of people enslaved in, in Germany during World War II. Um, we are doing better than we were. Uh, it is impossible, for, for example, for me to imagine the National Archives uh, sponsoring this program 40 years ago. Uh, I just gave a lecture at Monticello. Uh, the first time I went to Monticello and I simply asked the guide where the slave quarters were in relation to the house, uh, the guide yelled at me about trying to destroy the reputation of a great man. Uh, Thomas Jefferson. Then this time, the guide spends a great deal of time talking about Jefferson's relationship to Sally Hemings and the children he had with Sally Hemings. And the guide talks about the importance of the enslaved people uh, at Monticello. We are better than we were. Uh, you know, the statue of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis are no longer in Richmond. Um, I mean, I think I think these are important steps. Um, but are we where we want to be? Of course not. And will there be people who don't want to get to where we need to get? Of course not. I, I mean, what I think the United States needs, and I don't see it happening, but it, it would, you know, there are lots of things I never saw happening. I would have never imagined uh, Barack Obama or Kamala Harris uh, being a president or a vice president. So things do change. Uh, but I would love to see the United States have a cultural truth and reconciliation commission, a cultural event across the nation where we investigate our past, where we confront our past, where we understand how we got to where we are, and in the process, help people understand where we are today. Um, you know, I've taught in, I'm at Gratz College in Greater Philadelphia, but I've taught in Texas, I've taught in Louisiana, I've taught in, in North Carolina, I've taught in Virginia, I've taught in Oklahoma and in Florida, all of which are southern states, segregating states. I would often get students who'd ask me something about their, you know, should they feel guilty because their ancestor owned slaves or their ancestors fought for the Confederacy? And my answer was always, you are not responsible for what your ancestors did. You weren't alive. You aren't responsible. However, you are responsible for cleaning up the mess they left you. And I, and I, and I think that, that as, a, as an educator, as a historian, as a, sometimes a law professor, as a college leader, uh, I see that we need to do a lot better and a lot more education. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Tacoma Park for hosting this program. If you want to watch the entire films, any of the entire films, they're all available online. They're all in the public domain. Um, up on the upper left-hand corner, I showed the source. Most of them were Prelinger Archives, National Archives, or Library of Congress. And you easily can find them online. If you want to know more, or have questions, you can find me through nerdsmakemedia.com, our website. Thank you very much. Take care all. Good night. Watch some old films. Vintage movies. Vintage movies. Vintage movie night. We're gonna watch some.